Hi everyone, this is Dr. Katherine D. Harris, and I'm gonna give you another critical model to think about. Today, it's post-colonialism. So let's go through a few things about post-colonialism. When I have a major keyword, I'm gonna hold up a blue post-it note, which you should be able to read and write down that keyword, and also just skim through the video and see when I'm holding those things up. So let me give you an overview of what is post-colonialism, and then we're gonna go over to do the keywords through the post-its so that you're prepared for a conversation about it. So post-colonialism is a part of new historicism. It's also part of what's called cultural studies. And why it, it comes about after we've got all of the queer theory, the feminist theory, we're even still using semiotics, Marxism, and even some deconstruction here, if you'd like to, with post-colonialism. So we haven't forgotten about our other key concepts and, and key critical theories. So post-colonialism is geographically contingent, and it addresses how uh, things are marked on an individual literature and structures of power. It considers any cultural phenomenon to be worthy of serious analysis. And this is a quote of the definition of postcolonialism from one of um, a definition from a cultural studies dictionary. It's quote, a diverse body of work from different locations concerned with the critical analysis of cultural forms and processes in contemporary and non-contemporary societies. Okay, end quote there. It's an intersection of intellectual, personal, and political. So it has to do with both a character in literature and an individual, as well as the systems and the structures of power that are broader. But it's never only the individual. So you can never address post-colonialism just from um, a single character. You have to look at the entire context that's created in the work of literature itself. So one of the things about post-colonial criticism is that it's not necessarily a representation that colonialism is over. It doesn't mean after colonialism. Um, it's a relationship between power and knowledge. And think about how knowledge is constructed, especially in the 21st century, how text is constructed and how that creates knowledge and how it's disseminated. And the different structures that allow people to either acquire or disseminate or distribute knowledge. How does that happen? One major way that things are distributed is through dictionaries. That's when a word is supposedly made official. And number two, in educational systems, when one educational system is ported over to another culture. So those are also part of a system of power or a structure of power. So it deals with this impact of dominant ideologies on other cultures. So we covered what that word ideologies means, so go back and take a look at that. It incorporates several other models, including historical, psychoanalytical, feminist, Marxist, and structuralist. That whole language translation thing is really important because who is the person who's doing the translating and into what language and then what is lost by doing that translation? It's also about imperialism, nationalism, diaspora, which means the spreading out of people. And it also has to do with qualifications of what is third world. For instance, who says what country is third world and what qualifications are there? You very rarely see in the news the discussion about this is a first world and you never see this is a second world. There's only a differentiation between third world and everybody else. So for thinking about our structures of power, and we've always already used this concept of the other, the individual who's put outside that dominant ideology. And so that means that that person is not part of supposedly the major structure of power, the one that's, in, that's dominant at that particular moment. So this is not a condemnation of Western imperialism. That would be a political act. Remember, we're staying away from political acts just like we did before. We don't call somebody homophobic or a character racist in our literary analysis because as literary critics, we are supposed to have some objectivity. And to simply write that somebody is racist, you haven't gone through the intellectual analysis of that particular character and used evidence to back it up, all right? So let's stay away from that. So what post-colonial theory also does was fuel 
this idea of the the eradication of indigenous practices or the patriarchal culture, that doesn't happen as well. It's not just a noticing of that post-colonialism is at work or imperialism or colonialism is at work. It's how does it impact the meaning of that particular text, right? Okay, so, and texts are very broad by this point in the semester. Text can be a poster or an image or white space on a page. So we're broadening our idea, our idea of what is a text. For instance, a graphic novel has all of these images with it, but it also has very specific negative blank white space. What does that mean, right, in terms of a text? Okay. So now I'm going to take you through some key concepts and, and explain them. And these are the things that are going to be important to know. All right. So the first one that I have is called imperialism. So imperialism is enacted by an individual country through its political policies or diplomacy, or more likely through military power and force, All right? Imperialism, it's our first one. So imperialism is not necessarily the same as what's called colonialism. Let's take a look at this one. Colonialism is a representation of political control it's also occupation and exploitation for economic reasons. So this is our most important thing to note. Colonialism, political control, it's occupation of the land and the culture, and it's exploitation of that culture for economic means. Keep that in mind. It's really important. So next, let's go on to how do we distinguish among them? This is a little visit from Gracie. Let's see if she leaves us alone. So here we have this idea of dominant and subjugated cultures. Now a culture perhaps, for instance, in Heart of Darkness in Africa, doesn't exist outright as a subjugated culture without the, the opposite force. The opposite force is the dominant culture that comes in to colonize them. And colonization is a result of imperialist policies, right? It's done purposefully, never by accident. So a dominant culture is the one that walks in and uses force and subjugates the other cultures that are on that continent or in that land, or maybe within the boundaries of their own country. Think about Ireland. It is part of Britain. England walked into Ireland, overtook it, and slowly overtook the government as well. And then Ireland split in, into North and South one has control of its own ideas and its own identity while the other does not, right? Still to this day. Let's go to the next one. Here's another phrase that I really like to use. It's similar to dominant ideologies, but it's dominant hegemony. And dominant hegemony really refers to all the structures of a particular imperialist country. So dominant hegemonies is more than just ideas, it's enacting those ideas dominant hegemony. So let's do an example of it. So the British Empire in the 19th century expanded across the world with all of their colonies and they employed something that they called specifically in the 19th century the white man's burden. The white man's burden at that particular time was an imperialist policy to bring civilization and the industrial revolution to what they would consider countries who are not civilized. Now, yes, you see the problem there. How are we going to define civilized? So if the British Empire is coming in and saying they are the pinnacle of, of civilization and these people are not, therefore we need to bring them up to our level, right? So that's what the British Empire did. They deployed the white man's burden. They did this through the education system, through religion, through the print culture where they disseminated everything, all the pamphlets and everything that they printed up, specifically the Bible. Now the British were not the first to do this in the 19th century. We have the French, the Portuguese, the Spaniards, and especially the Dutch who've been doing this since the 1600s, especially in Africa. So one of the things that we have to be aware of when we're looking at something through a post-colonial lens is understanding what is the cultural bias that it's at work. That cultural bias at work. So the cultural bias means that somebody comes to a literary text as a reader or a literary critic 
and thinks doesn't really understand and recognize that they have that kind of cultural bias. You think that your culture is better than another culture just by virtue of you participating in your own culture. This is what happens in colonialism. People just very, um, the imagery is just land, sea people. You think I'm better than them because I wear linen clothing. They wear nothing. So therefore they are um, way too uncivilized and they're savages. So you can see quickly it goes from civilized to savage with nothing in between, according to the one who's part of the dominant hegemony. All right. One of the problems in post-colonialism or post-colonialism recognizes is that when a piece is written, a piece of literature or text is written from the dominant hegemony, it inevitably does not have the perspective or point of view of those who have been colonized or subjugated. So that means continuously all of the novels that you have been reading specifically before the mid 20th century really deal with the white settler point of view even if the literature isn't about someone being colonized there's always still going to be that imperialist policy written into piece of literature even unconsciously by the author and by the characters okay so one of the things that happens with characters is there's a sense of what's called subjectivity and subjectivity is a recognition of the existence in one's own mind, one's self-empowerment, subjectivity, right? That's important because some people have a view that their subjectivity is much greater than anybody else's and therefore obscures other people's or characters' subjectivity. So let's get more into these binaries. The binaries we have set up is the colonized and the colonizer. So for instance, the British Empire and anybody that they send to India and Africa, specifically South Africa and the West Indies, would be the colonizer at the bottom here. That's the one who represents the dominant hegemony and uses political control, occupation of the land, and exploitation of the economic resources. That would be the colonizer, right? The colonized are the ones who have been defeated or the ones whose culture is at risk for being eradicated. Let's go a little bit further. There's three different words I want you to consider or key concepts in terms of the colonized, the individual that's being subjugated or the entire culture. So the first one is called a subaltern. And it is specifically about the individual that is being marginalized or oppressed because that individual represents a particular culture, right? Subaltern, right? So in literature, you don't necessarily hear one character calling another character, you're a subaltern. But a subaltern represents, on the very surface definition, just a subordinate. But it could be a subordinate within that dominant hegemony already, that system of power. But subaltern in post-colonial criticism is really about the individual who has been marginalized or oppressed and is from that culture that's being marginalized and oppressed. So that's the difference there. The next thing about this subaltern, there are two concepts to take in. The first one is called hybridity. You can kind of read that one. Now, hybridity is a reference to an individual existing in both worlds, both the his or her or their own culture uh, and the culture that is coming in to colonize them. So that is an individual who doubles things, not lives in between, but doubles them and can exist in both worlds. But it doesn't exist, but the person doesn't exist equally in both worlds. They have a foot in both, which means that they ne don't necessarily have power in either. That's hybridity, right? The next one is sort of similar. It's called mimicry. You see this one? So mimicry is a subaltern who imitates the culture of the colonizers. So in mimicry, this is a character who disavows their own culture in order to try to mimic or imitate the culture of the colonizers. 
So they recognize the power of the colonizers and they want to take that on, not necessarily because they think it's better than their own, but perhaps it's just for survival. All right, so now a series of them that I want to take you through. The first thing that we need to consider in post-colonialism when you're reading a literary text is who's speaking? Because whomever is speaking is in charge. That's the person who's controlling the narrative and setting that up. We've talked about that before. The next thing that we need to look for are metaphors of empire and subjugation. So this means that they don't always have to mention colonizers or colonies or being colonized or, or subjugated. And stay, instead, think of it as, a, as an individual, an author, a person who's <laughs> a literary person. The cat's right there. <coughs> Think of it as a person who's in charge, but who does who feels disempowered or disenfranchised. All right. The next thing, so think about metaphors of empire and metaphors of subjugation. It could come up in the language. Somebody articulates, I don't have control, or articulates that there's a god or a king or an empire at work there. And it might just be in the imagery or a metaphor. It's not always going to be explicit. And it doesn't have to mention colonies or colonizing in order for you to take a post-colonial point of view. For instance, if you read Alice in Wonderland, that is about Alice, who's a subject of the British Empire in the late 19th century, going down below and seeing this wild and wacky land and trying to make sense of it. From a post-colonial point of view, you could read that Alice, a young child, through her language and her narration, is colonizing this weird, wild, and wacky, and sometimes violent land um, un underneath the world there. And you could also look at it in terms of the metaphor of she's above world on top of the earth and they're below world, on the, uh, below the rest of civilization, and live outside of the dominant hegemony that Alice lives in. Okay, so that's kind of an easy one. So the other thing that you might come find coming up over and over again if you're reading literature from the 19th century and backwards, it doesn't happen as much in the 20th century, is that an example of a metaphor or an imagery invoking this idea of a dominant hegemony as well as imperialism uh, policies uh, and representation of the colonized. So you might have, for instance, a description of an African with a European, Greek, or Roman nose. That's an attempt by the narrator, perhaps unconsciously, to create a character who's more in line with Europeans. And that would be getting them so that they could, um, so that that character could be understood by the Europeans, by the white settler point of view. So it's pulling them in and it's forcing them into a sense of hybridity with that character. Can you think of any characters that you've read about that it says they have an aquiline nose, but they're from Africa or the West Indies or maybe India or China? Ah, oh, well that is a call to be part of the imperialist project and the dominant hegemony so that that person who's part of that imperialist policy can understand that character, right? So I've already mentioned this one, bef one before, language can be colonized. A dictionary, once a word is published in a dictionary, it supposedly becomes calcified or hardened in its definition. Now this is why I always send you to the Oxford English Dictionary database so you can see the history of the use of that word and how the definition has changed. These days we have Wikipedia, which is really wonderful in one sense because it's constantly being updated by a series of editors. So language can be colonized. And an example there I've said is mestiza or mestizo. That is a combination of different races and ethnicities coming together to form a culture, right? Post-colonialism differs from race and ethnicity studies, which we'll talk about next week, but just know that it has to have uh, a colonizer and a colonized, metaphorical or real. And it's usually going to be about political control, occupation of the physical land, and exploitation of individuals and the economy for money and for their resources. So language is colonized, right? 
So I've already gone over the, the third world articulation uh, and what that means. So that's a colonization and an imperialist po policy by the first world. They get to declare who, what countries are third world. All right. So one of the things that I want you to think about is when you're reading literature, what's missing? Who's speaking? and whose perspective is missing. And the final thing that I want to leave you with is this idea of with some novels like Heart of Darkness, they're specifically from the point of view of a white imperialist European, Buddha Marlowe. So there is no direct perspective from an African. So as you read Heart of Darkness, are you coming at it and simply reinstituting Marlowe's white settler imperialist perspective? Or are you able to see it from the perspective of an African in the novel itself? It's a really subtle shift, very subtle when you're thinking about it. Because if you only think about the those who are colonized as being victims or subjugated, you can identify that violence to their culture. But at the same time, where are they empowered? And this uh, empowerment is, an, is attempted by articulating these two keywords. Let's do it this way. Hybridity and mimicry. Or do the people who are subjugated resist? Or do they simply continue on with their own culture? All right. Okay, so this one's long enough. I'll see you in class to discuss this much more. I hope the use of the post-it notes, we're gonna help you figure out those key concepts.